Good morning. Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I'm the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh, Indiana at 5600 Van Road. We would love to have you join us for our 10 a.m. Sunday worship, and you can also get there an hour early and then be there for our Bible classes as well. We have classes for all ages. You can also be with us for our 4 p.m. worship on Sundays if that is more convenient for you. And we have a another installment of our Bible classes every Wednesday evening. We actually just recently changed the time of that to 6.30 p.m., so we'd encourage you to join us for that as well. You can reach out and get in touch with us by phone at 812-550-6234. And you can also send emails to info at riverridgechurch.org. And we would love to hear from you and get back to you as soon as we can. Those are great ways to get your comments or your questions to us, particularly if it's a topic that you would like to see addressed on this program. It's also a good way to sign up for our six-part correspondence course. It's not a particularly challenging course of study or anything. It's just a relatively small uh, set of reading assignments and a hand handful of questions for you to answer in each of these little mini classes. And then you can send those back to us. Of course, we'll give you return postage and all, and then send you the next installment. And it's a good way to get a, a rundown of the most basic expectations that God has for each individual and his desire for each of us to be saved from sin. If you would like to receive our weekly bulletin in the mail, then you can also get in touch with us and sign up for that. Just let us know that's what you want, and give us your name and your address, of course, in either case. Today... We are in Zephaniah. I'd like to begin by reading Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Yikes! This is like some... Some real Old Testament fire and brimstone teaching, isn't it? It, it sounds like the, the perfect summation of the, the vindictive God that is portrayed in the Old Testament. Except, is it really? Well, in order to answer that question, we're going to have to examine this book as a whole rather than just cherry-picking a couple of verses that we might feel support a point that we previously believed. Why is God upset? Well, if we jump forward in the book to chapter 2, begin in verse 15, then we might start to understand. This is the exultant city that lived securely, that said in her heart, I am, and there is no one else. What a desolation she has become, a lair for wild beasts. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. Now, I'll grant that this is pretty light on details, but if we just examine what God is saying about the, the sins that have been committed by these people whom he is judging, well, I think we'll have to agree that he's, he's on to something, isn't he? First of all, he talks about this exultant city that is uh, taken down a peg, let's say, and that everyone who passes by is glad to see the city's downfall. So it's not just that God is mean and nasty, and, and we humans are uh, bearing the brunt of his vindictive rage. Rather, these people have committed heinous acts against one another, and when God steps in and passes judgment, the victims of this ill treatment are glad to see God's judgment rendered. He gets into some details about what is actually a second city in the early part there of chapter 3, talking about how her rulers are so corrupt. And he doesn't just say that, you know, they, uh, they enrich themselves, but there's not really any victim. He calls them roaring lions and evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. They are devouring the people that they are supposed to be protecting. On top of that, there's rampant economic oppression amounting to slavery in all but name. There's rampant violence. There's a religious establishment that professes to be righteous but 
lies and seeks its own earthly gain rather than seeking the spiritual health of the nation that it's supposed to be serving. Not to mention the leaders who are leading only for their own selfish advantage, the judges who are presiding over a system plagued by bribery and corruption that does have very real victims. There's drug abuse, especially among the wealthy, which n never leads anywhere good, not to mention the refusal to give God his due. So that's... All Ten Commandments scrapped and forgotten. Even though God has absolutely had it with his people, the message is not universally negative. So if we jump to the end, chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, we will read, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. And that's where we will eventually wrap up in this book. But before we can get to a full accounting of the mercy, we need to deal with the judgment that comes before it. Because, well, unchecked mercy shown to the guilty amounts to just hatred for the victims of their sin. Not only does God have a, a sea of victims to avenge, but he himself has every right to insist on his creation's respect and affection and obedience. So let's start at the beginning and, uh, well, with some background. Chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. That's everything we know about the prophet Zephaniah. It puts him into a rough time period of about the year 640 to 609 BC. So this is in the period in which the, the divided kingdom of Israel and Judah has turned into just one single kingdom in the south because the northern kingdom has already been taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And so we call it Judah alone. Well, this period ends, of course, with the Babylonians coming in, destroying Jerusalem and the temple and taking into captivity the vast majority of the, of the Jews as well. Let's talk for a moment about the audience of this book. We've danced around it already, but in verse 4, Zephaniah says... I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests. So this is pretty clearly to his people, the Jews, the people of Judah, but it's not exclusively about them. If we jump down later in the chapter to verse 17, he says, I will bring distress on mankind, so that they shall walk like the blind, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. And that sounds downright apocalyptic, doesn't it? Grandiose imagery, it's certainly not just limited to the Israelites or their immediate region, even if the specifics are all pretty close there in, in what we now call the Middle East. By the end of the book, it's become pretty obviously messianic and even ecclesiastical, I would say. But we'll get there eventually. A brief outline. Chapter 1 is God's wrath against Judah. Chapter 2 is where he says, but it's not just Judah, everybody's going to get a turn. In chapter 3, at least the first part, he returns his focus to the people of Judah, but in the latter part of the chapter, it's, well, wrath, however... Mercy comes. So, let's look at the wrath, first of all, in chapter 1. We've already read a little bit of this. We've seen that it is against the nation of Judah. We have looked at the, the reason somewhat that it's primarily about their idolatry. And that continues as we pick up where we left off and keep reading. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests, along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the hosts of the heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord, and yet swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. 
Okay, so God is jealous that they are worshiping the, 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 the host of the heavens, the, the sun and the moon and the stars, as well as Milcom, specifically the god of the Ammonites, who were going to come up later. They were a, a neighboring uh, nation to the Jews, and they did actually share a common heritage going through Abraham's father, Terah. Anyway, it's worth pointing out that, that not only is this about God's jealousy, although that's perfectly good reason for him to be upset, but when we look into the ways in which these idols were worshipped, we find that generally there's a lot of things like oh, cult prostitution, exploitation of the poor and the weak, and even child sacrifice associated with these cults. So, yeah, when you reject God's rules, the notion of human dignity eventually dissolves and you start seeing other people as objects to be dominated and used for your own selfish ends. For an illustration of this, well, consider the state of the world today. Enough said. He goes on into speaking of the defilement of his nation in verse 8. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. So God is like super xenophobic or something? What's up with that? Seems kind of weird. Well, no, that's silly. God is the God of all nations, not just of Israel. It's not that he wants Israel to hate the Gentiles, either. There are vast stretches of the Law of Moses that make this very clear. For example, in Leviticus chapter 19, where verses 33 and 34 read, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So no, it's not just that God is a racist or something, rather it is that God had selected his special people and he had given them specific instructions, and here they were, supposed to be set apart from the other nations, and instead they are being influenced by the other nations and adopting a lot of their practices, including, most importantly and worst, their religious practices. On top of that, there is economic oppression and greed and dishonesty among the Jews at this time. So after this focus on the problems of Judah, there is a sort of interlude on the day of the Lord in more um, sweeping fashion, let's say. And so let's pick up in chapter 1, verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. This and the verses that follow that we have read already sound incredibly inclusive, like almost universal, as if it involves not just God's people, the Israelites, or more specifically the tribe of Judah, but everybody. And so we start to think, maybe he's not just talking about the Jews being taken into captivity in Babylon, but it really only hints at what lies in store. In chapter 2, as I said, everybody's going to get a turn at God's wrath, but also everyone has a chance. Gather together, yes, gather, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff. Before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. From there, God goes into why the nations are going to receive his wrath. The Philistines come first in verse 4. For Gaza shall be deserted, and Ashkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon, and Ekron shall be uprooted. After that, Moab and Ammon, the descendants of Lot, uh, sharing that common heritage with Judah, as I mentioned earlier, as well as the Cushites in verse 12, and the nation of Assyria, beginning in verse 13. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like the desert. Why would he do that? What did the Assyrians ever do? Well, they spent their leisure time dreaming up new and exciting ways to torture and mutilate their captives, for example. They engaged in brutality above and beyond a, a means to an already evil end of subjugating the known world. It's as if their brutality became its own pursuit. Well, God didn't really like that, and so, verse 15, which we read earlier, this is the exultant city that lived securely that said in her heart, I am, and there is no one else. 
What a desolation she has become, a lair for wild beasts. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. No one is mourning the destruction of Nineveh and the fall of Assyria as the world power, because, well, she made enemies of everyone. Chapter 3, the first part, goes back to Judah, as we mentioned earlier. We read the first couple of verses already, but I think it's important to note how we know that we're back to Judah and not still talking about Nineveh and Assyria, because in verse 2, at the end of the verse, it says, she does not draw near to her God. He's not talking about the city of Nineveh not respecting its gods, because, let me tell you, it certainly did. But the subject has changed with verse 1, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled. It's not about Nineveh and Assyria anymore, now we're back to Jerusalem and Judah. Why? Well, the corruption among the leaders that we read about already in verses 3 and 4. Also, as the chapter goes on, we see a refusal of the nation of Judah to learn from the mistakes that others have made. The, the surrounding nations who have behaved very badly and been uh, judged for it. So, what's going to happen to Judah? There are going to be consequences. Verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. This isn't quite a description of the judgment of the earth and hell, but it's one of a relative few Old Testament prophetic sources for that notion. And it's with that realization that we begin, at least, to turn the page into seeing this not as God's uh, polemic against his people Judah and the nation surrounding it, but as something that has New Testament implications. Now, as I said earlier, the latter part of chapter 3 is a, a tempering of all of this wrath, and it does talk about Judah. Judah is to be restored. Judah is to become the center of a, a worldwide restoration and to become a refuge from danger, a place of peace, a place of worship for God, and there are hints at some kind of transcendent salvation in it as well. And it concludes with verse 20, At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Even just in that verse, there's a lot to note, but I think we should back up and, and dissect this entire section in order to make better sense of it. Verse 9, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Whom does God have in mind here? The peoples. And he says that the peoples, which is to say not just the people of Judah, but the nations, the Gentiles, are going to be unified in some sense to serve God with one accord. Almost as if their their language, which is, he says will be purified, will be unified as well. It's like a a reversal in principle of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. There the people were unified in their rebellion against God, and so God confused their languages in order to, to cause them to uh, fragment and disperse. But now he says he's going to gather them and purify their speech so that they can pursue a good purpose in unity. Verse 11. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me, for then I will remove from your midst your proudly arrogant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. Well, this is more specific to Judah, but more importantly, he's, he's talking about forgiveness. He's not, he's not denying that they have committed evil acts. He's just saying that he's not going to put them to shame for those evil acts anymore. By the way, I should note that it is tied to repentance. He's not saying that he's going to allow them to just continue behaving that way. That's where the first part of the book came in, with the judgment, God's righteous wrath. But that will also serve as a purification, a cleansing, so that only those who do repent will remain. And there's sort of a New Testament shadow here as well. Let's pick up in verse 12. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies. Nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. 
for they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Once again, you can see that sense of purification, and, and the remnant that remains will be righteous. Again, there are New Testament implications to this, and I should stress that he's not saying all Israelites will be perfect and righteous when this day comes, at least not exactly. I suppose in a spiritual sense, that is basically what he's getting at. But as we read in Romans chapters 9 through 11, there's this, this, this disconnect between the Israelites who were ready for the Messiah and who believed in him when he came and those who... Well, to use imagery from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, leave the veil over their faces and refuse to see the glory of God. For those who remain in Israel, there will be a code of conduct grounded in truth. Verse 15, The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. This is about salvation from God's wrath. Now, is this just about this particular spate of regional upheaval that was slated to occur in the, let's say, 7th through 5th centuries BC? It sounds a little more universal than that. It sounds like it's bigger. And I should note that he refers to himself, the Lord, as the King of Israel. That's an odd thing to say. I mean, God rarely calls himself king in the Old Testament. I mean, he is, but perhaps in part due to a particular idol called Melech, now called uh, Molech, God sort of downplayed that association and, and didn't want to use that word to refer to himself. That idol, I mean, Melech means king, uh, was known for, well, you know, child sacrifice and that sort of thing, which God very, very clearly disavowed from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 22. So for him to now bring that up and call himself the king and the king of Israel is, well, exceptional. And some Jews came to recognize this as a messianic title. Hence, John 1, 49, Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. As well as John 12, 13, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Back to Zephaniah 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. What a wonderful gift to have God's presence right there among your nation. He says that this is going to be a source of great comfort. And this looks forward not just to, you know, the, the rebuilding of the Jews' temple, although it does look forward to that, not just to them having a temple that at least represents God's earthly throne, but it looks forward in a more uh, important sense to the incarnation of Christ as well as the indwelling of God's spirit that was to follow him. Verse 18, I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. He promises an assembly. By the way, that's what the word church means, assembly. He promises a feast, which again has some New Testament uh, uh, foreshadowings. And he pro promises that he's going to continue to give them care, to provide for them, which is, well, another New Testament notion, not to say that it's not an Old Testament one, too. Verse 19, he promises healing. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame, and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Many who are last shall be first, and the first shall be last. That's a picture that Jesus presented of the Messiah's newly established kingdom, the church. When would this take place? Well, if we look at the near-term fulfillment, of course, there was going to be a return from the captivity, which would follow the destruction sent to the Jews, and the temple would be rebuilt, as I mentioned a moment ago. There would be some minor recognition of God and his people among the nations before the Jews were again ground under the boot heel of one king after another for a few centuries. Uh, leading eventually to a, a hated nation of weirdos who wouldn't get with the Roman program and had their temple destroyed, after which most of them were scattered through the world. 2,000 years later, there are still plenty who are holding out hope for that third temple, but I gotta tell you, you've missed the boat. There's already a third temple. Second Corinthians chapter 6, 
Verse 16, For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and be their God and they shall be my people. That's a quotation from Leviticus 26 and it uses very nearly the same language that God used here in Zephaniah 3, didn't it? By the way, it's not just 2 Corinthians 6 that brings this up. In Ephesians 2, we read the same thing. And 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Well, what about those who don't buy into that notion? What about those who say, I mean, come on, that's pathetic. God promised something real, not this figurative gobbledygook. Verse 6. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. Ultimately, all of this imagery of this, this spiritual temple is aimed at heaven when the faith becomes sight and the, the present weaknesses and shortcomings are rolled away to reveal the things that are unseen but eternal. Then you'll see clearly, for now, you're supposed to walk by faith, not by sight. We have seen in Zephaniah a clear picture of God's righteous wrath. And if you're honest with yourself you know that you deserve a share in that judgment. And that the judgment, like the promise, is not limited to this present life. And that should terrify you. But as usual, God follows up the bad news with good news. He wants to purify you, to secure your repentance, and to reconcile you to himself and to the rest of his people. He wants you to gather with the nations at the spiritual Jerusalem, which you can access anywhere in the world through faith. He wants to shelter you from the consequences you deserve, and he paid the penalty himself of his own accord without you even asking. He will add your name to his book of life if you'll just surrender to him. Not if you'll just say these particular words, not if you'll just do this particular penance, but truly submit your will to his. Now that will involve saying some words. That will involve doing some penance. It will involve obeying his instructions to imitate Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in baptism, and for the rest of your life, for that matter. We talked about the why of baptism, by the way, last week. You can find that on our YouTube channel if you missed it. What he wants is not some hollow profession, and it's not some goofy pantomime routine where you pretend to be good now and show everyone how righteous you are. What he wants is your heart, given over entirely to him, to do with it as he pleases. If you are ready to take refuge with God and to have him as your provider and protector rather than a pursuer and punisher, then we would love to help at River Ridge. You can get in touch with us by phone at 812-550-6234 or send email to info at riverridgechurch.org. You can also find us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh for Sunday morning worship at 10. I hope to see you there. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.